Dear Mr. Nordhoff, I cannot describe my mood when I learned of your departure. I'm not ashamed to say that I cried when the choir master read your letter to the choir. Es würde mir zu Gewissheit. Gottes Wille kennt kein Warum. I accepted it as fact. God's will knows no why. Ich wollte tapfer sein, das Unvermeidliche tragen und doch musste ich unterlegen. Nun sagen Sie mir bitte, aber es in Ihrem Interesse liegt. I wanted to be courageous, bearing the unavoidable, but I had to succumb. Now tell me please whether it is in your interest that we get to know each other more closely, to test each other. Dear Miss Laube, our correspondence has reached a point beyond which it can only be advantageously conducted if we are completely honest with ourselves and each other. And this condition forces me to decide whether I, for the first time in my life, should trust a person with things that I have heretofore kept for myself at the very depths of the shrine of my heart. Wir leben in einer schweren Zeit. Trug und Schein verhüllen die Wahrheit. Alle Menschen tragen irgendwelche in hard times. Swindles and shams cloak the truth. Everyone wears some kind of mask. Raw lust and cupidity show up everywhere. And it is a stroke of luck, a blessing, if one can remain straight and unbowed, if one does not succumb to temptation and can salvage one's faith and yearning for what is good, true and noble. received by parents at the train station with a proper little tongue lashing. They worried so much about us because they'd only received one postcard from us while we were vacationing in Bohemia. I would have so loved to see you leave. My train departed the train station approximately 15 minutes later. And then, at your parents' house, I was so lovingly and heartily received. Your parents, your brother and sister-in-law, fear has been lifted. I did not feel like a stranger in your midst. My dear Roland, it became quite clear to me. Your home is an irreplaceable treasure. It makes me happy that you won the trust and respect of my parents so quickly. Oh, my love, how, everything, how easy everything was. It was just so unfortunate that the specter of war cast a shadow on our last vacation days. Last night, I reread some of the letters that we exchanged after our first rendezvous. A year has passed since then, an eventful year. Nothing over this period has caused my great trust and love for you to shake. I only feel that much more deeply connected. Once, you wrote to me saying, We will both keep vigil, but with essential joy in order to keep it pure. I sometimes feel myself growing weak under your caresses. But I think of it without regret, dearest. You are the only one, the first to whom I want to give everything. Our parting, my dearest, was so unemotional. I would like to pro reproach myself for that. It was not at all a proper farewell. My return trip took place without incident. In the compartment sat an old lady and two men across from me. <laughs> I should not have worn the dress after all. The men paid far too much attention to it. <laughs> and today, 
Today I thank you for the love that succeeded in liberating my heart. It cannot burn so hotly in spite of the armor of ice that had surrounded it. Our days together as a couple in Bohemia, they brought us so much closer. No one but us knows of our secret. We were totally alone with our love. May God bless our upcoming marriage and watch over our future. And may God in his mercy avert the misfortune of war. Another turning point has been reached. Saying goodbye to this place will not be difficult for me. The school conditions were bleak and inadequate. I brought up my suitcase from the cellar, but it just stood there in front of my door, calling silently, pack away. It was daunting when I looked at all my belongings, a basket, two shelves, a suitcase, the violin, two boxes, and everything chock full. My new bedroom is a room with a balcony on the first floor. Hopefully, you'll be able to visit me soon. Now I again know where I belong. You have not yet been at War Club for two weeks, and your dear brother Siegfried is already wounded. How many others will share his fate? They sacrificed themselves for Germany, for us, selflessly. How many girls lose their beloved? I'm horrible and selfish. Should all those who just <coughs> some joy also suffer just because some dumb girl's wishes were not fulfilled? Even though I'm usually able to maintain my composure, this war caused me to be out of sorts and paralyzes every joy. When I arrived at my new post, I put a young man in charge of my suitcases, and then I made my way to school. I casually asked him about the headmaster. The boy replied, these are the soldiers. Many of the teachers here in town are busy at City Hall. There's so much clerical work that needs to be done since so many men are off to work, war. But reassurance and order have set in again. I established the start time for school at 8.30. I sprightly trampled through due in the morning to my new job. The adolescents from 8 to 11, the little ones from 1 to 3, but school was just an afterthought. The backtrack to my trivial turmoils is always the tremendous unrest of what is happening in the world. Those of us on the home front want to do everything we can, with joyful hearts, to show our loved ones on the front. We support you completely. We think, feel, and hope with you. And if necessary, we too are prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice to achieve peace. By the way, the mayor was out and about issuing ration coupons for groceries. I found out about the following situation in my conversation with him. The district school inspector has treated him in for a younger, not as qualified substitute teacher. A real disciplinary teacher. Your dear mother is so strong. Not one word of complaint, not one word betrays her feelings about your brother. She's even supportive of others. Respect and awe is what I feel for her. Only a woman, a mother, could know how much inner strength it takes to know that your beloved is out there somewhere. To be prepared to receive the worst of news every day. I never deeply felt the seriousness of the great war or the evil of father's chronic illness. My long hospital stay, grandmother's death, my love of you, and now the misfortune of this new war. These things have pushed my hands together and folded in prayer. May God protect and bless those brave souls who are ready to sacrifice their lives for the fatherland. And may their commitment also continue to be rewarded so we can all soon believe in peace again. My dear, dear Heather, I have to admit that in the hustle and bustle of recent days, and due to the political events that have caused such a stir, my thoughts of you sometimes slip into the background. My dear, dear Roland, just imagine that I even needed a ration coupon for your mother's birthday gift. On the whole, though, I think the measures that are being taken are appropriate and 
everyone is in the same boat. Groceries and other products are still in stock. Hoarding is completely out of the question. Back at home, there are things that make me feel safe and secure like a child. There lies the treasure chest of letters. There lies the album of photographs. And there lies the memory of our hours together. There the security to which I can retreat at any time. At the textile factory, there's a shortage of yarn. There's been a flood of orders and it's causing everything to come to a halt. Father is sleeping already. The poor man has had daily night shifts at the railroad as part of our air raid drills, even on Sundays. I'm actually growing weary of the blackouts of the day. Our life today sometimes seems to me like a dream, like a ghost or some other kind of unreal story. Nothing is enduring. Everything is fleeting. Nothing has absolute value. Everything is questionable. Nowhere is there security. Everywhere there is unrest. I was shocked when our boss told us the news about the startling incident that happened on November 8th. One can be thankful and happy that the Fuhrer miraculously escaped this cowardly attack when I, I don't know, dear Roland. I can't help but still have a strange feeling. I don't want to write it. I would prefer to be with you today. On Sunday meetings with family, they're so short and therefore so unreal. Long before anyone has had a chance to say their part, each one already has to go in their own direction, into the dark, uncertainty. Who knows if I will ever see my brother again. Mother and I drove to the city on Saturday. Just on the way to the train station, we saw three farmers who were laying down with rocking horses. The stores where merchandise was for sale without ration cards were completely overcrowded. Well, the salespeople were certainly not bored in any of those stores. But out and about, in a hubbub over the train stations, the way everyone searches and roots around and scrambles through the confusion like crabs on the ocean floor, it is confusing and spooky. But it was terribly good fun to go along with the flow of the hustling and bustling crowd. Joyful anticipation for Christmas was written on every face, in spite of the rationing. <clears throat> we purchased a porcelain vase for your dear mother, and we also found a catch. I myself bought a pair of shoes, a salamander. But even at home, there's this radio, this specter, this monster, this magic box. Uncannily, it always broadcasts the most disturbing news that then follows you, even into sleep. But do we not have to stand in solidarity with our dear soldiers on the front? In the past few days, all members of the German nation have been called to donate care packages. We too put together a small package with tobacco, cigarettes, apples, lighters, and a packet of matches. Those are the most coveted items. <laughs> I also wrote a few lines to the unknown soldier in my parents' name, including a return address. Perhaps I'll learn the name of this unknown soldier. <laughs> I confess, curiosity is sometimes a remarkable weakness in women. I am so sorry to hear about the Finns. And the thought that the Russians rate the Finns with their tacit approval leads me to doubt once again. It's all driving me crazy. The world is horribly confusing. Where can you still find law and truth, good and evil? Where would all of it lead? Will God's justice overtake human beings? Love of my heart. On how many weak, thin threads where our happiness and love hang, if we wanted to believe in the fickle moodiness of chance. We would have to pass away from fear and suffering if we do not know of God's plan and providence. My dear Hilda, it is a raw and wild era that we are now experiencing, a time full of dangers, a time of trial and visitation. Many people deceive themselves about the seriousness and gravity of our times, completely failing to notice or numbing themselves. Yes, they are poor. And their happiness is a false, short-sighted mirth. They cannot sense the power that comes from Christmas. 
which binds people together so solidly in mutual love and aid. They see only the insecurity of life all around them, living one day at a time. They do not pose a question of the meaning of our era and do not sense the finger of God. New Year's Day, 1940. Dearest heart, I am so looking forward to building a nest with you for the first time ever to establish something in the world that is our own. Sign on one's door, reading Nora, and behind it live two people, Hilda and Rosemary. Someday it ought to be a parental home, too. A shelter, a, a foothold, and a signpost for children. <clears throat> These are not audacious and grandiose goals, but they are in no way easy and small. And no longer quite so private. You announce our engagement? I went, as always, to choir practice. A lot of people were already there. I greeted them indifferently and sat in my place and talked with Louisa. No one noticed my ring. No one knew anything. It was so fun for me. <laughs> she did not give away our secret? You know how she is. She couldn't hold herself back and ask loudly, Well, have you still not yet congratulated our bride? She pointed at me and everyone shook their heads until they raised my hand with force. What of Dora? How did she respond? She shook my hand and wished us all the best. <clears throat> that made me happy. I I had the feeling that her congratulations were the most sincere, even though they were probably just a formality. How about our choir master? He gave a speech, but I couldn't really understand over the confusion and excitement. Hilda and Roland, they joined forces wanting to make a life for themselves together, committed wholly to creating something, to represent something. Their nest will soon have its own smell, become a world of its own, and the most secret and best parts will never leave. <laughs> while the hostile and evil parts could never enter. Then, we sang for the Baltic Germans who had been resettled temporarily in camp. They applauded like a file, but one of them stood there, all alone against the wall. He looked at me the entire time. <clears throat> when I moved toward the door, he laid wait for me on the stairs in the crowd of people. I did not let Louisa leave my side. I saw how he followed us. I just cannot forget them. Those eyes. You know how I regret the union of marriage. It is a holy estate established by God, insoluble. I have no need of some strange man. I care for only one man. And to that man do I give everything. Even though we have only just gotten engaged, we already live in a house of our marriage, and those who walk by look curiously at how we are furnishing it. And they, they exchange conjectures and expectations. Dearest, I am now completely unchallenged by temptation. You should never think that I could be untrue to you. That is impossible. Now, surprise. I received a truly lovely letter from my friend Ilsa. Dear Hilda, please tell me all the news about you and Roland. Where is he now? Has he been conscripted? Did you already have a shotgun wedding? <laughs> please be sure to send him best wishes from me and my husband. <laughs> <laughs> she provided an exhaustive report about the little goblin, as I call him. He is the greatest joy for his thriving marvelous things. He was baptized over a <coughs> festival, and he is also very obedient and easy, and they can hardly imagine where he gets that from. She put a thick exclamation point behind that. My husband hasn't been drafted yet, and probably also won't be. He became headmaster on October 1st. He is often away on business, though. As a speaker on behalf of the district, all told, he's very busy with his regular work, plus the party, local community, and all the rest. It is nice they found one another. <laughs> I think that they're connected by love and common interest. His additional responsibilities of party official are indeed honorable, but it often demands great sacrifices. Did she admit to regrets after she married? You can read it for yourself. A certain pride 
resonates in these lines, but at the same time, a quiet melancholy. <coughs> If I know Ilsa, it will take some getting used to for her to live this kind of life. She's accustomed to something more exciting. But now that she's a mother, she must live and be happy for her child. It's an old fact that the higher one's occupation or rank, the more tightly one is bound to one's duties and responsibilities. Nowadays, where almost every man has to serve the fatherland in some way, either voluntarily or by obligation, the women and mothers have no small tax. Does that mean you're hesitating or <coughs> with regard to our future plans? For me, recognizing the challenges and me retreating from it. With all my strength, I to stand by your side and face all tribulations with you. And I trust you completely. Even now that our courtship is public, I know that it will hardly be necessary for my guiding hand to safeguard our good reputation. Oh, the evils of gossip. One should be above such things, but ruminating about it makes me totally sick. Speaking of gossip, on Sunday, I ran into a woman who was uh, visiting my landlady, a teacher's widow in her late 50s. She had an imposing, aristocratic appearance, but a natural, straightforward manner, in fact, due to her heritage in the countryside of Sudan. This woman expressed her wishes to see a picture of you, so she could confirm her impression of you. I satisfied gladly. Does this widow have any children of her own? Indeed. Her daughter was training as a kindergarten teacher, but spent a year as a caregiver in Holland instead. She then taught gymnastics and handicrafts, and imagine, she traveled from school to school on her motorcycle. Now she teaches home economics in Bavaria and offers leadership courses in the Association of German Girls in East Prussia in Silesia. This widow told you all this? And more. Her daughter is only 28 years old and has already had longer relationships with men, but they did not hold. The girl has become so independent and overbearing, and inherited from her father's side, that, it not, that not at all affectionate, and also so restless, insecure, and based in her morality. You certainly seem fascinated by this young woman and her motorcycle. I do not mean to gossip. The good widow is herself not satisfied with her daughter. Is there not something specious and grandiose about this young woman's resume? This mannish woman has built a life of harshness and restlessness. But in hearing about her, I felt so deeply in my good fortune in having your love, our love. It's almost too beautiful to be true. Yesterday, I once again went through the history of our love step by step. I grew so happy inside. God's goodness had officiated over everything that happened. To me, it's as if I'd taken a trip into a fairy tale, fairy tale land. A land where a flower blooms, our love, and what was once just a bud has blossomed evermore under our eyes in its full splendor and beauty. March 31st, 1940. Love of my heart, my dear, dear Roland. Something has awoken in me of late. Bliss, desire. It's something that makes the world beautiful and life seems so wonderful. It must be joy. When I was young, this is how I imagined love. Love of my heart, my dear, dear Helen. In the theater of the world, the stage is still set with this wintry scenery, and at the moment, the director is letting us know. I am its audience, as I sit here in my window seat. Only the position of the sun reminds us of the approacher bringer of joy. My dearest love, 
do you not also some, sometimes get frightened by this impossibly grand joy that we've been permitted to experience? Fear of joy. Fear that it could be too big and the fear that it could therefore someday come to an end. Easter time is a period of rising hopes and expectations, for it is a time of change and transformation. This is also true for teachers. But if vacations have been suddenly shortened to one week, I have to force myself to go to work. I see this as yet another rather short-sighted measure on the part of the party. Changing classes, changing teachers, cleaning the buildings, all of that in seven days, of which four are holidays? That is impossible. You do prefer to do your work on a regular schedule, but maybe you should wait a little, my dearest, before you begin to complain and show your indignation. I'm just so angry with authorities. They have completely lost their senses. This is not a vacation. Nothing is certain anymore. Today they say one thing, tomorrow the next. Yesterday I collected the little ones, the children who were starting first grade. Today I received instruction that the school year begins Monday instead. The foreshortening of vacation will not be impacted by changes made in the school calendar. The next announcement comes right on the heels of the last. That is how they operate. They will probably announce on Tuesday that instruction was supposed to begin on Monday. These boneheads. Many schools don't even have cold yet. Well, if we have to close school for lack of heat because my supply of coal has run out, then at least I will know where I am in terms of my schedule. Sweetheart, I so yearn for a token written in your hand. How I wait for it. I too had to deal with the authorities this week. I thought the story had been retracted, but on Monday afternoon, a messenger brought a summons from town hall. Mother delivered it to me at work, and it said that I had to appear at the police station at five o'clock, but we're now required to work until six, so I called on them at 6.15. How did it go? I found the commissar and Louisa sitting in the room. I greeted them both with Heil Hitler, contrary to my normal habit of greeting Louisa with a handshake. She was rather pale and watched me incessantly. I met her gaze staying calm and cool. Miss Lava, do you know why you have been summoned here? Yes, I replied. I remain completely reserved. The commissar was very proper. He actually only asked me three questions. Have you spoken to anyone about your girlfriend? No. Do you suspect anyone in particular of writing the note? No. Are you prepared to help your girlfriend to read this person out? Yes, I said. And then he gave some directives to Louisa, some criteria to ident identify seditious behavior. I suspect the culprit works in the factory. Can you think of anyone suspicious? No, I cannot. Nor I. Very well. I will let the matter rest until something new takes place or another letter arrives. Hi, Hitler! Hi, Hitler. We were let go outside. Louisa and I spoke again for the first time. All the post offices have been notified. In town and also in the bigger cities nearby. They want to catch the writer using fingerprints. and want to get the advice of a detective. You have to admit that the accusations are indeed based on truth. Neither your fiancé, Werner, nor his friend should take offense at something that happened two or three years ago. And your relationship has only really existed for a year. The party will not tolerate this person meddling in personal affairs that date back years and is none of their business. Let it be what it will be. I scarcely believe that anything will come of it. And now, the latest. I learned at work that Louisa received an order from the employment office. She's a transfer to a factory on the Baltic Sea coast. I did not say a word to her, and she said nothing to me about it on Monday. The first transports depart this Friday. She must have been postponed until the next one, because the first is already full. 
is she trying to avoid being relocated? No, she's glad she can get out of here. I just don't know anymore what to think. I'm not in a squabble with her, but from now on, I can no longer view her as a friend. It may be irrelevant. You may never see her again. Well, what about you? I was scared, but it was a false kind of fear. My conscience was clean. It was based on the fact that I did not know if Luis's impudence had cast a shadow of our happiness. Is there a danger that you could be relocated as well? I'm, I'm not worried about it. If the employment office calls me up, my parents will not let me go. You either. But if the draft begins again for the farmers, one cannot get out of, then you'll have to come and get me. Or give me your name. Would you like that? Hmm. Not yet you. <laughs> <laughs> but I do love you from the bottom of my heart. Yet, here we sit, like two birds trapped in their cages. You there, me here. And we only want to be together, yet we cannot. Necessity holds us captive. But we are hoping that the bars will soon be drawn apart. That he might bring me home. Like in a fairy tale. And hoping that will also end for us the way it does in fairy tales. And they lived happily ever after. Many things still need to be done before then. Many evil impediments threaten and could stand in our way. What harm does it do, this long waiting? It teaches us to really treasure those hours when we can truly belong to each other. What luck that so many paths are pre pressing such that I will forget my impatience. A pile of exercise books lie on my shelf. Next week, I have to give the students written exams. Excuse me, Mr. Teacher, please do be merciful when you grade your papers. They should all be able to be glad, even the low performers. Sometimes, I think I would be able to complete all this work more efficiently if we shared a household. If I could work in a comfortable room. If you could throw in a good idea now and then. And if we were encouraged to hurry up so I could be quite free to spend time with you. We should not tempt fate. We may experience the joy of our love care for you, while others know that the person they love is far from home, under the threat of danger. That little incident when you were on your way home last time brought this fact to my attention. Did something happen to Lisa and Warren? When we got to the bus stop, Werner was traveling back to his squadron while you were heading back home. The doors of the bus slammed shut, and Louisa and I still stood there until it drove on. She raised her arm, the bus passed by, and like a helpless child, she let her arm sink down. I could hear her crying. She walked past me towards the center of town. I no longer trust her after the last incident, and yet I felt for her. I could not see you anymore, but at that hour, I was so thankful that I knew you were heading for safe harbors. These challenges are not easy for adults or for children. To make sense of the danger and understand its historical necessity, leading my students through these difficult ideas compels me to hold myself accountable and clarify them for myself. The lessons that profit me the most, personally, are in religion. My faith. I have three new topics. The first, why do we imagine God as a person? The second, the world runs according to a divine plan, and every person in it is accounted for. And the third, each of us belong to himself, to the state, and full, and to God. How I would love to sit quietly in class and listen to you speak. Tell me a little about the last one, about God and the fatherland. Human beings command themselves. The state commands us, that is clear. And God commands us. He intercedes in our lives. That is particularly evident in the lives of the great men. 
but one only need pay attention to recognize the unseen hand in our own insignificant lives, letting us fail here and granting us success there. That reminds me, on Monday, I received a lovely letter from a soldier on the Western Front. Should I tell you his name? And then today, in the crossword, heroic figure from German legend, six letters, starting with R. You're clever and wise. I'm sure you will recognize him in the mirror. In preparing the lesson on our relationship to the fatherland and to God, I myself once again become clearly conscious of how we lay, in fact, in his hands. I do have to get used to the fact that you too will have to serve the fatherland someday. Probably every young woman worries about that. If you are called up to serve, I want to be completely courageous so you will not have a heavy heart for my sake. I have not yet even asked my boss for days off, no less announced that I intend to quit. He is not in a generous mood. But right now, my thoughts are far more distracted by the news coming from the north than from work. I heard about it on the radio. An invasion of Denmark and Norway. This main event has really sidelined everything else that serves our private life. Our leading men are making history. All the world is watching us at this moment. As our Fuhrer made a move in the last minute that probably none of the other states had foreseen, and it will probably save us from the great calamity, assuming that the English do not get to Norway before us. So, is this the prelude to a fight? Believe me, I'm not so clear on the morality of the matter. Whether I should be happy about how things are turning out, or whether I should give in to the enormous concern that swelled up in me again. Joy and concern? Doing too much of either is, I think, probably not the smartest thing to do. Don't torture yourself, dearest, or me, with concern that are not yet justified. You. You are so right to put me off my dumb thoughts. Happy is what we want to be, dearest. Really happy. Is it not a wonder that our love blossomed in these confusing times? How would I find my way without it? Does a life in this era have any worth without love? To take care for the one she loves most on earth. To tremble from worry and then go gain peace through unfighting love. To achieve this goal is the most beautiful task a woman can fulfill. Yet the most difficult. Sometimes I am alone happy that I cannot serve as a good friend or colleague for you. I would like to enter far deeper into your world, but that would be only appropriate if I were your comrade. You once said, A woman that fully introduces into the world of a man is no longer a woman. <laughs> I do believe this to be true and know it to be true. Do you believe that I'm happy simply because you love this woman as a woman? Yes, I do. Dunkirk fell. I heard about while shopping. The victorious German army expelled the British expeditionary force. There is no loud, joyful excitement to be heard regarding this great victory. Thankfulness. We feel deep thankfulness for God and our precious soldiers. May he watch over our German fate with grace. I remember September 1st, 1939, the day of the declaration of war. For several minutes, I saw before me the whole great calamity and heartbreak of this war with all force and clarity. Since then, we have all grown harder and more united. I'm dreadfully sorry about your uncle's son. Such a young, energetic person, but considering the pain that death brings with it, the family ought to be quiescent and thankful that he's still there for them, alive. How many people came back from the last war in his condition, missing a limb, and nevertheless rediscovered the joy of life? Sunday afternoon, we went to a furniture deal. 
I was most excited about the bedroom set at 650 marks. After that, we visited the furniture maker right across the street from us. He is currently completing other kinds of work, uh, other kinds of contracts, and will only build kitchen sets again after that. So we'll have to be patient till then. Saturday afternoon, I went with mother to the shop to ask about the chairs. We got lucky. The dinings that we wanted had arrived, and it's a very large amount of money. So I do not want to ask my parents for it because they can't afford it. We can make you work with the marriage loan from the party. Did you already go to the chemist's health office for your medical examination? I received the summons on Friday. My boss led me off straight away, and at 6 a.m. I arrived, and by 7.30 I was in the office. Please fill that form out with your personal information and your family history. <laughs> what about my fiance? Him too. After that, I came into the examination room. The doctor. I had already seen him before, and we'd ridden together on the streetcar from the train station to his office. He was always running behind me. I thought he was just some bureaucrat. And I was shocked when I realized he was the person who was going to examine me. But there was nothing irregular about this, right? He was on his way to work. I tell you, I've never had an examination like this before in my life. <laughs> I have to tell you in person. I cannot write it down. There was a struggle if he excused himself. You did not wish to disrobe in front of a male physician? But it is necessary, my dear, in order to secure a certificate of area lineage. You must demonstrate that you do not have any inheritable diseases. Surely you had nothing to fear about your purity. You know what else he said? I have lots of admiration for you, Miss Lauba. I wish you lots and lots of luck in the future. And in the three years that I've been at this office, I guarantee it, you, Miss Lauba, are only the fifth girl to marry in your condition. I could not say much. I was so ashamed. I was really glad to get out of there. I think we might want to consider moving up our civil ceremony. I don't have a job anymore, and if we wait until October, I'll have no support whatsoever through the summer. Father is of the opinion that in the current housing situation, we are not going to get into a permanent residence before October anyway. And should we? Then, we can still decide when to get married at that point. I talked to my parents and they think we should decide for ourselves when I come see you on Saturday. So, if we wish to move things up, I would like to ask you to, again, go to the civil registry office and request your parents' marriage certificate. I went to both the church and town hall. I'm including the document you need with this letter, so my marriage certificate on its own won't be enough to secure the marriage loan. One has to have the Aryan certificate. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler. Congratulations, Ms. Lauber, on your forthcoming nuptials. You may borrow this document only under the condition that you bring it back no later than the day of your civil ceremony. Without it, you cannot marry. I reassured him with the knowledge that we are requesting these documents in good reason. No doubt you're exhausted from all this bureaucracy. But the day only got worse. While shopping, a truck drove past me very slowly, bringing wounded soldiers to the school building. Once back home, this same official stopped me as he was coming from town hall. Hi, Hitler. Hi, Hitler. Mrs. Lau, I want to ask a question about your fiancé, Mr. Norov. Your records state that he was born in 1907. The local draft board, as you know, has already gotten to the men of that year. I was shocked. And you know yourself what my lively imagination makes of everything that scared the wits out of me. I'm 33 years old. What kind of times do we live in now? The day only got worse from there. I was already beside myself, and I barely got home and put down my shopping when the doorbell rang, and I hurried to open the door. I will never forget what my eyes saw. 
My heart stopped beating, words stuck in my throat. A terrible uncertainty arose inside me. Louisa stood before me. Was it not the same Louisa who stood there next to me at work, always so happy and fun? The first thing I noticed was the black attire that enshrouded her whole figure. She scared me to death. The tears fell from my eyes. I could not help it. I grabbed for her and she tumbled rather than came into my arms. Her burner, her fiance fell on the 10th of May when the first planes flew to Holland. All I could manage to do was stroke her hand. She sat with me for a while and calmed down a bit. And I led her to the door and she promised to come again. She's often entrusted her secrets to me and she sought me out in her pain. She waited for me. I want to help her if I can. Dark is the background to our happiness and the suffering and pain around us makes it, to, makes it seem to me all the more precious. I will, I will praise and thank God on the day when its darkness around us gives way. May it not be far away. Believe it, my Roland. This incident has shaken me up so terribly as if it had happened to me. Actually, last, that night, right after I, Louisa left, I lay in my bath and I wrote a letter to you telling you of what had happened, but I ripped it up and burned it yesterday. I was so melancholy that day, I should, should not have written in that mood. I have to admit to being shocked. You ripped up a letter to me? Burned it? I cannot help but feel hurt. I treasure each and every one of your letters. They document our relationship, our love. Your admission has affected my whole day. Or did you destroy it for some other reason? Did you write something that could have compromised you or us? The local party officials all know you want to marry and will thereby become needed at home. Why would they wish to separate loving couples, especially if they have demonstrated their pure Aryan ancestry? Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! It has come to our attention, Miss Lauber, that Mr. Nordoff has not always demonstrated the degree of enthusiasm for party activity that behooves an educator of the next generation of Aryans in the Third Reich. Military service should provide him with the opportunity to fully demonstrate his commitment to the people's community. They want to conscript you. If they do, I know it will be the result of underhanded, underhandedness by certain persons who wished you ill in the past. You know how subtly many people work, especially those at the leading positions in the party. I expect the pettiest malice on the parts of such people. Dear heart, much work and care still stands before us until we get to our celebration. But I will not let the threat of the party, conscription, or even war dampen my joy on the day when our hands will be interlocked forever, entering into our life journey together. They say you must leave for basic training in August, just days after our wedding. That means that I'll only see you one more time, and then maybe not again for a long, long time. Dearest, I have a request, a big, intimate request. I'm afraid you won't grant it to me, but if this one wish should correspond to God's plans, then he will help to fulfill it. I don't want to write it. I want to tell it to you.
I am now ready to grant you this wish. I'm so grateful that this bachelor may go back to the school of love. Let the greatest of all heaven's gifts be my master. I thank you sincerely for your so loving mother. It really cheered me up. It freed my heart and broadened my horizons in this time of hopefulness and trepidation. I'm so thankful that I belong to you. There is no reason to doubt the success of our plans. Quite the opposite. I know that you are ready for us to bear a little ugliness with a good share of courage. Yes. I now believe in our victory. I believe in it completely. And I can no, it can no longer be so very far away. That we Germans may experience these times. It is indeed also a mercy, after all, of the victims. Though our common struggle and work, will our Germans not become more closely bound together with one another? How beautiful it will be. Someday in the future, we will be able to tell our children how our people, our Volk, our Germany, standing close to the precipice has fought its way upwards thanks to God's dispensation. By sending us a man to be our Fuhrer, to whom we will be able to look with awe and reverence for all time. And thanks to our people's true void is an unflinching fulfillment of duty in all situations of life. We have to correctly take stock of the meaning and greatness of this thought. We must never forget the pain which the war caused to us Germans. But that pain will necessarily be eased by the idea which this war represents. Even those who do not have children of their own must feel that. For this war is a matter of greatness, of the unity, of the future of, young, of our young Germany, of Germany's eternal existence. So beautiful to think. The land on which our children will first set foot will be hallowed by peace. I can well believe that your thoughts have already completely turned towards our wedding day. I will feel the whole weight of it once I close the school doors behind me and uh, prepare myself to travel to you, my dear bride. The growing certainty that the war will be over soon in France adds to our joy. I'm convinced that we may hope for better times. I now mark each new victory for myself on a map. Your paperwork is all complete. Congratulations. Here is your complimentary copy of Mein Kampf, a wedding gift of the Fuhrer. We look forward to many healthy Aryan children from you, Miss Lab. And Mr. Nordoff, you will be pleased to know that you have been honored with enlistment in the German Navy. You are to report to basic training in Kiel in two weeks. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! Dearest, our little worries disappear in the context of the large picture of world history. I am no longer fearful for the future 